Hey guys, good morning. Okay, so today we're going to kind of step back from the realistic fiction and we're going to be reading two biographies. Uh, one is about Nellie Bly and the other one is about Jacob Rees. Uh, these two are both gonna have some social studies connections in them. And then uh, my plan is if you want to find more information on these two people, um, I will have them in my post below. And then if you don't, that's okay too. Then you are going to go find a biography on Epic and I shared two bookshelves with you. One is called Brilliant Biographies that was made by Epic and the other one is one that I have made and I think I just titled it Biographies and you're going to find a person on there and maybe create me a uh, Google Slides with information in, from the book that you found about that person but I'll post more about that below. So first person we're going to read about is Nellie Bly. So I have posted the book below. Uh, go ahead and click on view with the little magnifying glass and it'll come up and you can follow along as I read. I'll give you a second. Or five. Or six. Hello. All right, so you should be on chapter one. It's titled A Woman in a Man's World. These days, some women news reporters work in dangerous situations. They travel all over the world to investigate and report on a wide range of crimes and injustices. However, this hasn't always been the case. Nellie Bly became a journalist or a reporter in the late 1800s. During this time, there weren't many women journalists. The women who wrote for the newspapers were expected to write about safe subjects, such as gardening and fashion. Writing and editing news stories was considered a man's job, and Nellie Bly shattered that notion. Many people called her America's first investigative journalist. So um, my first question is, how was Nellie Bly different from other women journalists that were out there? Uh, think about what were they supposed to write about, and then what did she want to write about? I feel like we should be having a conversation right now. I'm listening. You're right. Hopefully you are. The women were supposed to write about gardening and fashion. Well, Nellie didn't want to write about that. Uh, she wanted to investigate things and um, talk about different topics. All right, page three. What was Nellie Bly's real name? Nellie Bly was born Elizabeth Cochran in Cochran's Mills, Pennsylvania in 1864. The town was named after her father, Michael Cochran. Cochran was a wealthy landowner, businessman, and judge. He died when Elizabeth was only six years old. Although he was wealthy, her father didn't have a will, so Elizabeth's family was left with little money. Nellie Bly's hometown, as you can see there in Pennsylvania, Oh, look, we're like uh, over in here. So there Nellie lived. When Elizabeth was a teenager, the family moved to Pittsburgh. Her mother rented out rooms in the house to help pay bills. Elizabeth wanted to be a teacher, which was one of the few professions considered to be suitable for women at the time. However, there was no money for her to complete her training. Uh, so it says her family didn't get money from the will. So what happens is when someone passes away, there is a piece of paper that says where everything needs to go. Um, so, for example, when my mom passed away in her will, she left money for my brother and my sister and I. And she said that money was only to be used for education. So, of course, we all used it to pay for our college funds. Um, so there's like certain things that people will leave and it kind of gives directions on what to do. So how Cochran became a reporter on page four. In 1885, when she was 21, Cochran read an article in the Pittsburgh Dispatch. The article made the proclamation that girls were good for marriage, but not for education or career. Cochran was outraged and she wrote a letter of protest to the newspaper. The editor was so impressed with Cochran's letter that he offered her a job about the newspaper. Cochran took the job and became a journalist. 
At this time, journalism wasn't thought of as acceptable work for women. Most women journalists used pen names to disguise their true identity. Cochran adopted the pen name Nellie Bly. Nellie Bly was the name of a folk song. So if I read the folk song first, it says, Nellie Bly has a voice like a turtle dove. I hear it in the meadow and I hear it in the grove. Nellie Bly was a heart, has a heart warm as a cup of tea and bigger than the sweet potatoes down in Tennessee. And then your caption says, a verse from the folk song Nellie Bly by Stephen Foster is shown here. So a pen name is kind of like a secret name, right? Um, and she used it to disguise who she was. So let's say Miss Carper was a journalist back in the 1980s. Um, and maybe my pen name was Fred French Fries. I don't know. Made it up. Um, so I would be writing as Fred French Fries, but nobody would know I was a female writing the article. So that's kind of why she changed her name. Page five. Oh, and it looks like it's a sidebar. Do you see it? It's kind of, it has a heading. Mm, sidebar. Text feature. Uh, Life for women in the 19th century. In the 1800s, a woman's role was to care for her family, and when a woman married, she became the legal property of her husband. She took her husband's last name and handed over all of her belongings to him, including her money. People thought women weren't as intelligent or as strong as men. Women had to take care of the housework. Without washing machines, dishwashers, or microwaves to help, it took longer to do household tasks. Housewives spent their days cooking, cleaning, sewing, ironing, and doing laundry. All the things that I hate to do. Yuck. Caption at the bottom says, in the 1800s, women and girls did most of the household duties by hand. Ugh. Can you imagine? Can you? Oh my gosh. Can you imagine doing laundry by hand? I would wear the same outfit for a week if that's the way it was. Though I would be smelly, so I probably wouldn't do that. <laughs> Chapter two, Bly's Daring Assignments. Bly wasn't satisfied with writing about the topics that were considered suitable for women reporters. When she began her work as a reporter with the Pittsburgh Di Dispatch in 1885, she reported on things she was passionate about. Her articles often divided public opinion. For example, the investigated, for example, she investigated the terrible working conditions faced by female factory workers. Bly's article about factory conditions fascinated readers of the Pittsburgh Dispatch. However, it caused tension at the newspaper. Some of the companies that Bly criticized in her article advertised in the paper. Newspapers used money for advertising to pay for the cost of producing the paper, and companies threatened to stop placing advertisements if Bly continued. The editor told Bly to write about gardening and fashion instead. So the caption says, women in factories worked long hours in crowded conditions and had poor and were poorly paid. Um, so the moment she started to write about the poor working conditions of women, what was the effect? So the cause is she wrote about poor working conditions of women in these factories. What was the effect? Check in the last paragraph on that page, page six. So it says that the newspapers, people were pulling their advertising. So the advertisements are the little boxes at the bottom of the newspaper in which show the uh, places that you can go and shop at. So those advertisements, people pay to put their advertisements in there, help pay to make the newspaper. So if they don't have the advertisements, the newspapers can't be made. So Nellie Bly was... It was not a good thing. So that's why her manager told her to write about different things. Page seven, Bly on the run. Bly refused to write about safe topics. In 1886, she convinced the editor to send her to Mexico to write a travel log. However, she didn't just report on her travels. She also wrote reports about the poverty and political corruption she witnessed in the country. This included a report about a Mexican journalist who was sent to prison for criticizing the government. Eventually, Bly had to leave Mexico to avoid being arrested. 
Her stories were published in a book called Six Months in Mexico in 1888. When Bly returned in, to the United States, she moved to New York City to look for newspaper work. After four months of rejections, she was almost penniless. Finally, she talked her way into reporting for the pioneering newspaper, New York World. She won the job by taking on her most notorious assignment. It says, I was too impatient to work at the usual duties assigned on women's newspapers. Um, so she basically almost got arrested in Mexico, which was not good because of her uh, writing things out there. Um, what was the other word I wanted to point out? Blah, 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 blah. Oh, to criticize someone. It says that people were criticizing the government, which means to say that you don't like the way that they're doing things um, or just saying what they're doing is wrong. Um, yeah, so and a notorious assignment. Bold print word. It's in the back. Notorious means well known. Hmm. Interesting. Next page. Ooh, this looks interesting. In September 1887, Bly went undercover as a patient in an asylum on Black Wells Island near New York City. She reported on her experiences in a series of articles. In the 1800s, people with mental illnesses were often mistreated. Bly endured filthy conditions. She was fed rotten food and suffered beatings and ice cold baths. Bly re reports provoked outrage. People couldn't believe the conditions in the asylum were so terrible. The stories led to review of the asylum, and as a result, the asylum's funding increased, which allowed officials to improve patient care. The caption says, until Bly exposed the state of Blackwell's Island Asylum, the conditions were terrible for patients. So why did she go undercover? So to go undercover means to like disguise yourself and go somewhere. So let's say I disguise myself and go undercover as a Dunkin' Donut worker. And I go in to see how the donuts are made. And I dress up like a Dunkin' Donut worker and I walk in there and pretend like I'm new, right? And I find out the secret of the Dunkin' Donuts. Um, why would I go undercover, right? So they don't know who I am. Um, so because she went undercover, if you don't know what an asylum is, an asylum is, it's a bold print word. Let's check in the glossary before I give you a poor explanation. It's a hospital for patients with mental health problems, which is kind of exactly what I was going to say. Um, people who are not mentally sane or kind of all there go to a mental asylum. And so they are taken care of there by doctors to make sure that um, they aren't harming themselves or harming others. So she went there undercover. So not the safest of places to go to rather than the Dunkin' Donuts that I just went undercover at. Um, but it kind of shows that she is a risk taker, right? I mean, how many of you, by a show of hands, would go to an insane asylum to write a newspaper article? Yeah, notice I didn't raise my hand. That wouldn't be fun. Not at all. And to go through that and to pretend like you're a person there with the rotten food, beatings, and ice cold baths. I hate ice cold anything. Showers, baths, ugh, gross. All right, now that I'm off task. Next page, page nine. <laughs> Helping zoo animals. Bly continued to report for the New York world about injustices in the city. In 1984, she interviewed the president of the American Society for the Prevention of Cruelty of Animals, or the ASPCA, John P. Haynes, about the Central Zoo Park. Haynes was investigating the conditions there. He was concerned about the filthy hippo pool and the lack of shelters to protect the bears from bad weather. Haynes was advising the keepers about building new shelters and taking care of animals. Through written Writing such stories, Bly exposed unfairness and wrongs. Her determination often led to changes in her community. I have never written a word that did not come from my heart. I never shall. I like that quote. Uh, the caption says, Haynes helped zookeepers at the Central Park Zoo create better shelters for the animals. That's so neat. So because she's going undercover and finding all these things that are wrong, 
there are changes being made. And this is one person that's making a change. Can you believe that? This is my favorite chapter about Nellie Bly. Love it. Chapter three, Bly travels the globe. In 1888, Bly felt restless, which means she had a hard time sitting down and sitting still. She would not be good in the quarantine. She read the novel Around the World in 80 Days by the French writer Jules Verne and was inspired. In the book, a fictional character tries to travel around the world in 80 days. Bly resolved to achieve the same goal, traveling solo. On November 14th, 1889, Bly set out her most famous journey. She was going to travel around the world alone. To meet her 80-day deadline, she traveled in haste by ship, train, and even, at one stage, in a rickshaw, a tricycle with a passenger seat. Many people opposed the idea of a woman traveling alone. Bly did not care what they thought. She boarded the first ship with little luggage and headed east from New York. Her journey took her to London, England, and on to France, Egypt, Singapore, Hong Kong, and Japan. She wrote articles and she went and sent them to the paper by telegram and mail. People at home followed her journey with great interest. So the caption there, on her journey, Bly carried just one small travel bag and stored money in a bag around her neck. She took one bag? I don't think I could travel with one bag. Around the world? I don't know. I don't know. Um, at the top, sidebar, women and travel. Women and travel, sorry. At this time, it was unusual for women to travel alone. It was thought that young women in particular needed an older companion to keep them safe. People also thought that women should not travel long distances and that they needed far too much luggage to pack all their belongings. Like some of us. I always overpack. Once back in the United States, Bly took a special train from San Francisco. The train's engine the Queen was one of the fastest on the South Pacific Railroad at the time. Bly was whisked back to New York 72 days after she left. She completed her trip in fewer than 80 days. So um, the picture there is kind of neat. Um, it says Bly's trip created such interest that a board game called Around the World with Nellie Bly was developed. So if you look really close at it, it's got... Um, each day and kind of like where she went around in there. If you look really, 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 really close. Kind of cool. So she went around the world in 72 days. 72. Crazy. Um, how did she prove wrong? How did she prove others wrong with that trip? What did she prove wrong? Think about that sidebar, women and travel that was on that page. She proved them wrong by saying that, number one, she could travel by herself. She was capable of doing it. She traveled faster around the world than 80 days. And she didn't have to pack that much. She had one bag and one little small wallet around her neck. Kind of cool. All right, I think we're almost done here. Yep. All right, page 12. In 1895, Bly married millionaire businessman Robert Seaman and retired from journalism. Seaman owned companies that made products such as milk cans and barrels. Bly began running one of the companies, and Seaman died in 1904, and Bly took over running the companies. However, the companies closed in 1914 because they owed a lot of money. After the companies closed, Bly returned to journalism. World War I was starting in 1914. After the next five years, millions of people perished on the battlefields. Bly was on vacation in Europe when the war broke out. She rushed to the war and became the very first woman journalist to report from a war zone. So this little thing down here was um, printed. It says the ironclad factories are the largest of their kind and are owned exclusively by Nellie Bly, the only woman in the world personally managing industries such as in such magnitude in Pan American Exposition 1901. Um, random thought that I just had, Nellie Bly wasn't even her real name, right? 
Let's go back and say my text evidence. Her real name was Elizabeth Cochran. So she continued to go by Nellie Bly. Mind blown. All right, next page. Into the danger zone. Uh, before we start reading, I want you to look along the side. Hang up. There's a timeline. Boop, boop, boop. Um, so the timeline basically gives us uh, an event, important events that are in order chronologically. Social studies. All right. During the war, Bly traveled from the front line. She wrote reports on many aspects of the war. For example, she wrote about the different conditions for officers and soldiers. Officers lived in clean, warm quarters, while regular soldiers lived in grave like trenches. A Red Cross nation for wounded soldiers was bombed, and Bly wrote about how even these neutral areas weren't even safe from attack. After the war, Bly kept working as a journalist. She used her writing and public addresses to help her community. She found homes for children and jobs for women and raised money for people in need. Bly died from pneumonia in 1922 at the age of 57. After her death, New York's Evening Journal declared her the best reporter in America. Last page. Nellie Bly was a reporter for the underdog. She spoke out for people who had no money, no power, and no voice. She searched, she searched for the truth in difficult places on the factory floor, inside an asylum, at the zoo, or on the battlefield. Bly helped bring out important social change by writing about the problems that she saw around her. Bly was a courageous reporter who never took no for an answer. Her travels took her around the world, and she never stopped helping those at home. In 2002, which I totally remember this, Nellie Bly was honored in the United States postage stamps. So I remember this um, because I remember my mom putting it on a envelope and I said, who is that? And my mom told me about Nellie Bly. So then when we found this book was in Wonders, I'm like, oh my gosh, it's Nellie Bly. So there's book number one. I'm going to stop this video and then start another one for Jacob Rees, who is just as cool. Um, give me a whoop whoop for history because I love learning about this stuff. So give yourself a break. Go get a snack. I'm probably going to go get a snack. <laughs> um, and then come back for my next video.